This morning's scripture reading comes to us from Psalm 84. And it's going to be verses 1 through 12. This is from the New Living Translation. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who has set their minds on a pil pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clo clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear, appear before God in Jerusalem. O Lord, God of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, O God of Jacob. O God, look with favor upon the king, our shield. Show, show, our, show favor to the one you have anointed. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will, with, will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. Thank you, guys. Uh, for those who didn't know, we, we've got, this is our prayer partner Sunday. And so those two, Nate and Chris, are brand new prayer partners. That's, that's the way to get it going as a partner, is to, to be reading scripture together. The best part is they didn't know they were doing that until they, they got united this morning. So that's, that's exciting stuff. Uh, we celebrate a pattern of prayer. We celebrate that as a family. We could take some of our children and some of our adults and we could put them together and they can be raised and fellowship in, in that family atmosphere. And it is a beautiful thing, says the one who got to walk that pathway to. Uh, we're talking, uh, because Psalm 84 is a, a psalm of movement, is a psalm of traveling, I want to set before you the perfect road on the perfect day. Get yourself comfy because you're choosing what vehicle you're in. Okay, if, you, if you've got a convertible 65 Mustang in your mind's eye, go ahead and hop in. You know, maybe you're a lifted uh, bro dozer, get in that, whatever you want, okay? But get in the front seat, put your hands behind the wheel, and here's the question. Perfect car, perfect road, perfect road trip. What song are you going to have playing? Whew, that's a tough one. You know, I tried to look up the greatest road trip songs of all time, completely subjective, because I got to a list that was all Taylor Swift songs, and I went, that ain't it. I got to one that it said, life is a highway, and I was like, that's hokey, that ain't it. But there's so many different songs, and depending on your generation, you have a specific song in mind. You're like, oh, that's my road trip song. You know, when I think through my life, there was times when it was just blasting rock and roll, and then it got a little, a little softer, a little smoother. There was a period of many years where it was whatever tunes kept the children quiet. Um, and then there became a period where, like, oh, no, they're repeating lyrics, and then you pick some other songs. But what song do you play? You know, we, we entered into this talking about worship, about what's your song? What draws you? And, and man, after this morning, I just want to record you guys and just have strong God playing out of the speakers from here on out. I mean, man, God is awesome. And so I ask all this, and because here is, here's the understanding. Psalm 84 is a traveling psalm. It is people heading to the temple, heading to Jerusalem. And what I want us to understand, here's the main point. Gather this one and then go to sleep. Okay, you ready? Like, did we just get permission? Living in worship. It's going to change the way you travel. May not change the road, may not change the vehicle, may not change anything else, but living in worship, it's going to change the way you travel. And so I want us, um, as we go through Psalm 84, there's, listen, this isn't my doing, this is God's doing, this is from the psalm. There's three points, all right? Some of you grew up, every sermon was a three-point sermon. You guys know who you are, okay? Okay. This psalm has three points. I'm going to call them routes built into it. 
Those of you of a newer generation, a simpler generation, I will wrap it up and, and put it all in one point. Is that fair? Okay, some of you want three, some of you want one. We'll get there. But I want to talk about these three routes, and they're going to be described uh, as we read through this psalm. Your text may say uh, what blessings, um, or uh, if you're going through the NLT, as I'll have up here, it's going to say what joy. All right? When you see a route you want to take, you think, oh, what joy. You know, when you see traffic ahead of you, but you, you see you've got an alternate route, you think, oh, that's a blessing. These are the routes we're going to look at this morning. And there's three built into the text. Uh, in Psalm 84, uh, I'm going to read the, the first four verses. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body, and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home. The swallow builds her nest, raises her young at place near your altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God. Here comes that blessing. I've highlighted it. I've bolded it. Here it comes. What joy. What joy for those who can live in your house. Always singing your praises. That first route is, whose house? Whose house? If you want to make your worship about your house, the tunes are going to be the blues, okay? They're not going to be the, the greatest of songs. If you were to take your life and write out some lyrics, some of us would be like, that's a country song, okay? You lost it all. That's a country song. But, but we've got to understand our route, that first blessing is we sing about God's house. We sing about his dwelling place. This is a psalm of traveling, and we are traveling home to the Lord. We are excited about our destination. We are excited about things get better. Things are greater. And so we've got to understand what we're traveling for is whose house. But here's something awesome. In the midst of our destination, in the midst of our traveling, something unique happens. Because when you long for the Lord's house, when you desire to be with God, you become his home. You go, well, well, wait, how does that happen? And the longing is a desire, and the longing is a worshiping, and in the longing we see the good news that those who desire God and come to him through Jesus Christ, in their longing there is an acceptance, there is a belief, there is a bowing before Jesus we become his home. And think through that for a second. We become his home. When you long for the Lord's house, you become his home. The paradox, and let me get to the scripture here. The paradox is here in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. Don't you realize that all of you together, okay, all y'all, okay, we're going southern style here. All y'all, say it. Say it out loud. Come on. Look, at, look around and say, all y'all. There you, you're welcome, okay? Don't you realize that all y'all together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Look to a brother or sister and tell them the Spirit of the Lord lives in them. Tell them. Okay, now, like some of you partake in this activity. Some of you just sit there and look at me. Tell someone around you that the Spirit of God lives in them. Let them know. Look behind you. Look to your left. Your left. Let them know. Okay, better crowd participation when, when the preacher forces it. <laughs> All right, that sounds great. And then God, and then the scripture goes on, God's going to destroy anyone <coughs> who destroys this temple. Well, we got it, Dark. God's temple is holy. You are that temple. Here is the paradox. The welcome mat to God goes both ways. The welcome mat says welcome in both directions because we welcome God in and he welcomes us in. And the paradox is the Christian life is where in Psalm 84 we see those traveling to the temple. He says, I'm going to be in you. I'm going to make my presence in you. I'm going to tabernacle in you. You will be the temple. And so we as traveling people have the Lord upon us within us and we've got to remember that and celebrate that that we've got God with us we've got God with us what does it mean to long for the Lord to long for the Lord uh, going back a, a Sunday before we talked about idols 
And we talked that the devil is no different than the road construction crew because he's always widening lanes, adding lanes, and doing what he can to make that highway to hell as wide as possible. To long for the Lord doesn't matter which lane you are in, but you make a U-turn. It doesn't matter which lane you're in, but you say, this ain't the direction I want to go. I, I want you, God. Um, Isaiah 35, the whole chapter is a, a, a talk of hope, a talk of restoration, a talk, a talk for those that are struggling and then they're in a hard place and there's promises. It's saying, be strong, do not fear, for your God is coming. He is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when we are on the highway to hell, there is nothing better than know there's another option. There is saving grace. There is salvation. And where that salvation comes from is in Jesus. In Isaiah 35, 8, it says this. It says, it will be named the highway of holiness. Oh, it just sounds so good. Where are you traveling today? I'm on the highway of holiness. How are you rolling today? I'm rolling on the highway of holiness. And just that excitement of knowing all it takes in our life is to say, the me, me, me mentality is, is taking me in an eternal destination I don't want to be a part of. But when I make it about you, Lord, we turn that bus around and it's the highway of holiness, pursuing God. That's our first route, that's our first blessing, the recognition of whose house. It's the Lord we want to dwell in. Going on into, farther into scripture, we're going to get to route number two. Verse 5 just starts off right from the get-go. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, pause there, some of your translations say valley of Baca. We don't know historically where that is, but something tells us it's a dry and weary land. Some, some commentators would say the, the trees looked as if they're crying and sad and mourning. Through the valley of weeping, when they walk through the valley of weeping, it'll become a place of refreshing springs. In the desert, there will be hydration. In the desert, there will be living water. The autumn rains will clothe it and bless it. And finishing in verse 7, they will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. What blessing is this for? What route is this? What joy is it? It's for those who have set their minds where? On a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Your text may say, Zion, that still exists for us today. It's the heavenly home with our Father. And so the blessing, the route number two, is we've got to have the correct vision. We've got to know our destination. We've got to be able to look and say, this is the direction I want to be heading. Um, any of you the uh, the house flipping the uh, the house improvement channel shows, you know HGTV, Magnolia, DIY, those kind of things. How many of you you just binge watch those things? Okay, all right, we got some we got some here. You see, you know what happens? Those of you who watch it, they bring a a a couple to a house. They're like, hey, we can get a great deal on this house, and it's never a house anyone would consider buying. And so they, they bring the couple in, and, you, and you've got one of them. They're thinking this way. They're like, this could use a bulldozer. Maybe just let's just burn this down. You know, there's that thought process. But it never fails. And maybe it's the designer. Maybe it's one, a part of the group. But one person's looking like, I'm pretty sure there's a tree growing out of this house. I have made a, a solid point that if there's a tree, it's not for me. Okay? I don't want this house. But it never fails. Someone looks in the exact same house, and they go, Oh, just a little picket fence right there. Ooh, shiplap. That's going to look so good. And you got the other person here thinking, burn it down. <laughs> and what happens? They start out, you start off the show with, with what is the grossest house, and then you get to the end of the show, all of us watching go, that's terrible, no one would want that. By the end, we all go, that's beautiful, I love it, I want it but we forget that there's a whole lot of work that goes in between. And a lot of us, in the midst of our house, in the midst of this place, we say, Lord, just burn this thing down. 
Where's the bulldozer? I'm pretty sure there's bugs around me. Can we just, can we just get rid of this? But we need to have the correct vision. We need to have the correct understanding of what is to come. See, they don't move right in in the midst of the slum. They work and they allow those things to go on. And then there is some improvement done. And so what we need to understand, that we can say, we can speak this, we can look at the temple. This is the house. We are the temple. We can look and go, man, this is terrible. There has to be some self-recognition. When we look at our lives, we go, man, God, there's some things that I think you should just bulldoze. And frankly, let's just, let's just, let's just burn this thing down. We can look at, at the life around us. Maybe we think, okay, this is livable, but the neighborhood, it's awful. See, some of you, in your current circumstances, you can't see beyond how gross and how decayed, how decaying it is. And you look and you say, this isn't a kitchen if there's an oak tree growing through the middle of it. This isn't a place I can habitat. This is, Lord, get me out of here. This is terrible. And I want to give you, I want to give you something. You can say this. You can say this every single day. You can look at your situation and you can always cry out, Lord, this is terrible. If, if in your correct vision, you also counter it with this. Are you ready? I'm giving you full permission to complain, okay? You guys, some of you are like, I complain anyway. I didn't need permission. <laughs> I'm giving you full permission to complain about your current place, your current state, your current life. You can holler out all day long, this is terrible. If you have this vision and you immediately counter it with this, this is temporary. This is temporary. Listen, some of you have been through some terrible stuff. Some of you are in the midst of terrible stuff. And some of you are like, well, terrible's coming. But we have got to counter it with this. This is temporary. And it doesn't matter what is going on. In the light of our eternal Father, all is temporary. The one thing is eternal. And that's our relationship with Him, with our family, through Jesus Christ. So go ahead and call it what it is. But have that vision. This is temporary. And have that vision of that completed home. Have that vision of the glorification we get in Jesus Christ. When the knees are creaking, the back is aching, when all those parts seem to be falling apart, then I know a God who is going to make all things new. And how great that will be. The correct uh, vision is our route number two, our, our blessing, our second of three points. I'm going to jump back into the scripture to get to point number three. Picking up in verse eight. <clears throat> oh Lord God, and, and I gotta, I'm, I'm sorry, I gotta pause for a second, because in the midst of, of Psalm 84, there's just an interjected prayer. So he's, he's reading along, and then he, just, he just throws a prayer in the middle of it, and here it is. Uh, oh, Lord, God of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, O oh God of Jacob. Oh, God, look with favor upon the king, our shield. Show favor to the one you have anointed. And, and I want to just pause for a second, because we should be able, in the midst of just recognizing the terrible and temporary, there is a place for us to, try, to cry out just, oh, God, oh, God. Oh, God. And wherever you are at, be a person that is A-OK -okay with spontaneous prayer. Be a person in the midst of whatever is going on. You can just say, oh, God. Oh, God. I'm going to pray for us real quick. Oh, God. May we cry out to you. May we recognize you. May we see that you have given us a king in Jesus that also is our shield. We know that in our belonging to you, you are working to shape us to become more and more like your son. And Father, in the midst of everything, can we pause to pray, to talk with you, and in our travels, carry on with you. Father, for the brother or sister, for the one struggling this morning, that when we can cry out, this is terrible, 
and their heart is absolutely aching with that reality, Father, whisper to them, it is temporary. Father, for those that they are right now in the valley of weeping, overwhelm them, overwhelm them with life springs of your love and of your presence. Father, we love you. We thank you for giving us the greatest traveling partner in your spirit. It's in the name of King Jesus, I pray. Amen. Moving forward in the psalm to our final, our, our third blessing. Into verse 10. <coughs> Single day in your courts. Better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. Uh, some of your translations likely say the tents of the wicked. We've talked about tent dwellers. That's not the place you want to be. That is temporary. Those things are going away. We want the house of the Lord. We want to live in the house of the Lord. We want to pursue that homecoming with the Lord. And verse 11, for the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven, heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. There, there is, I could pull six sermons just out of this section here. There is so much good stuff. There is so much good stuff here. But I'm going to stick with the, the routes I'd originally planned and told you. And so what we are looking at in verse 12, O Lord of heaven's armies, here's the blessing. Here's the route. What is it? What joy for those who what? Trust. trust in you. That third, that final route, it's trust. It's trust. It's understanding that God has got it. It's understanding that I can go God's way. What does trust look like? Let me, let me explain for a second. Trust is, we, we've got Valentine's Day coming up. Gentlemen, you're welcome. Remember that. And on Valentine's Day, you get a nice red shirt, okay? And you read the directions, brand new red shirt. What do the directions say, the washing instructions? Say cold wash and, and key with light colors. And you go, oh. And then you take it over here and you flip on hot wash and you throw it in with a tub full of whites. You walk over here, go about your business, you pull it out of the washer. Now what do you have? We got everything's pink. And you can say, oh, how festive. No, no, we're never excited about that. Here's what happens. Do you guys, okay, you guys get that. You guys have been there. You've done that. Right, who do you blame for that? How dare you, Haynes, making red garments? I mean, it's just like, ugh, the shame, the shame. Guys, this is how we live. This is how we live day by day by day. We open up the good book, we read the instructions, and then we go and do something completely different. If we trust God, we would listen to him. Crazy idea. I'm going to go bold here. What if we listen to God? I know. What if not only listen, but then we put it into practice? We obeyed what he said. Because the problem is a lot of us are steaming red in the face because of the reactions, because of the results, because of the consequences of our life. And God is sitting here going, hey, I, I told you cold water with light colors. <laughs> See, if we trust God, we should follow God. If we trust God, we'll do what he says. And when we're not trusting God, let me give you another example, another visual. There's a whole lot of muscle pain that goes on. There is a whole lot of shoulder aches or back aches, and, and I'm just going to label the current problems that you have as some muscle pains. But here's the simplicity of, of where you get muscle pains. They come from two places. There's probably other places. I'm only using these two because I'm the preacher and I'm in this. Two places you'll get muscle pains. One, too much, or two, bad posture. Okay, so by too much, you're either carrying too much weight or you're going too long. 
Um, I am, you can tell, I am not a weightlifter. You're welcome. Okay, didn't mean to surprise you. But I had a feeling that if I was going to try and max out a bench press, knowing there's a good chance I could fail and my literal neck is on the line here, I would want someone next to me that I trust, and not only that I trust, but preferably strong. I'm not going to get Jeremiah and be like, hey man, spot me. We've got to understand something. There's weights that we are going to carry, and we've got to recognize who's going to spot us. Some of you, you will never lift a finger. You expect God to do something, and he's sitting there ready to spot you in this life, ready for you to get stronger. And what we don't realize is some of the little things we're going through, <coughs> some of the little struggles, some of the little problems are to make us stronger. But we don't like to hear that, do we? Make it easy, Lord. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make you stronger. That's not what I prayed for, Lord. <laughs> but I know what's best for you, child. Okay. The other part of this, some of us never stop. From the beginning, the Lord has said, "Have a day of Sabbath rest. Have a place of rest." And now Sabbath for us now is not a day. Sabbath is a place. Sabbath is our Lord. Sabbath is Jesus. And a lot of us are holding on to stuff, holding on to way too much, and we have the open arms of Jesus walking alongside us to carry some of these things. But we just don't trust Him. And the other option is bad posture. How many of you guys have had a work day where you came home and you're just bent out of shape? Like, everything's sorry. Like, I did absolutely nothing today, and I feel terrible. And it's because of how we've contorted ourselves throughout the day. It's the way we stuck uh, uh, in front of the keyboard, or, or maybe the, the way we worked on whatever we were working on, that our bad posture has this less left us in terrible pain. Do we understand that there's a proper posture before God? Remember, he's not a vending machine that we get to push the buttons and get what we want. <coughs> I fear that for a lot of Christians, they've got a small God, and they talk down to him, telling him what to do, treating him like a dog. Fetch. Come on. But the proper posture before God is one of reverence. The proper posture before God is one to just be awestruck. The proper posture before God is to realize He is the strong God. He is the one that carries the weights. He is the one that walks with us. He is our sword and shield. That is the proper posture. And here we are, just with the sword, pinned us down against the ground, thinking we can carry it, going, what's going on? Let God be God. Let God be the one that will sustain you and carry you through. Find the proper posture, and those muscle pains will be gone. Living in worship, it will change the way you travel. When you know whose house it's about, it's not about ours. When you have the correct vision of how he is shaping us as his temple into something beautiful. When we have that vision, we will go through the renovation process. That's called sanctification. And then finally, when we trust, when we truly let God be God, when we obey his commands, when we read it and we say, well, that's nice. I'm going to shut the Bible and ignore that completely. No. We trust and obey. I promised some of you that you'd get a one-point sermon, and here it is. For those of you that, that, can we just wrap it up with one point? Here's your one point. Worship defies gravity. Worship defies gravity. When you are traveling down life's road, and you are in a place of worship, there is kind of this floating that occurs. Some of you are like, really? Does that happen? Worship defies gravity. It pulls us away from those terrible trenches. Doesn't change them. Doesn't even remove them. But we kind of just float over those things. Worship defies gravity in the midst of a relational crisis that we can just pause long enough to remember God, 
to praise God and sing through God. And all of a sudden, nothing has changed except the proper placement in the worship of our heart of who God is. And, and all of a sudden, we, we kind of were able to pull away. That worship defies gravity. That worship will, will take us out of this world. That worship removes us with, from those things that obvious are holding everyone back. And, and we get this brief release. You know, when we talk about being out of this world, I'm still kind of dumbfounded that we did this. I mean, is it not amazing that some dudes got in like a, a, a metal boat that shoots up into the sky and ended up on the moon and they got out and like, sweet, here's the moon. And then they came back. That still blows my mind. But now here's the problem. I'm, I am switching gears big time here, okay? We, we went from worship defies gravity. We're going to talk moon for a little bit. But the problem is, as these pictures come back from NASA of the men walking on the moon in these footprints, some of you already got your tinfoil hats ready. You know what's coming. If you look at Neil Armstrong's spacesuit, you go, wait a second. Okay, hold up, here it is. We get these pictures, and then we get the spacesuit. I'll draw your attention closer. Huh. Those things don't go together. And then conspiracies abound. Now, but for those of you visiting, be like, wait, is this this kind of place? No, we're not. Okay. <laughs> let me let me. I'm trying to make a point here. So you're like, bummer. I was hoping it was that kind of place. When we carry too much weight, we've got to drop some stuff. When we carry too much weight, we've got to set some things back. And for the the trips to the moon, there was specific moon boots, overshoes put on, but because of how heavy they were, they were purposely planned not to be brought back, but left on the moon, okay? We traded sweet moon boots for moon rocks. That was the plan. Like, hey, we're going to carry back so much weight, we gotta, we got to leave some weight. And so they were left on the moon until Apollo 17 where defying orders, the astronauts are like, I like these boots, I'm bringing them home. And so we have in the Smithsonian some actual used moon boots or over shoots. Okay? Some of you are like, where, what are we doing right now? Where are we going? Let me, let me get the point here. When you look back upon the pathway of your life, will the footprints appear any different? When you look back on the travels you have made in this life, on the places you have gone, when people can see the remnants of your footprints, will they look exactly as the soles of your feet, or will it look like you're walking in the Spirit? Will people go, wait a second, that doesn't match up. And you go, I know. God was carrying me. Man, I was floating in the Spirit. I was living in the spirit. I got through that tragedy not by my feet, but by the spirit walking with me. By the spirit there for me. That I could get through this because of what God had done with me and for me. I want to wrap this up. I'm trying to think I've been kind of struggling with the best way to articulate this, but sometimes the best way is the blunt way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of call out the entirety of the church, not just here, but at large. Let's have fun. We waste so much time after we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, panting, breathing out, begging, Make it better, make it better, make it better. That in our faith life, we, we come to the Lord, we know who the Lord is, and then we're, we're like those baby birds in the nest, just squawking with our mouths open. Call me crazy, but I'm pretty sure the Lord intended for us to fly. I'm pretty sure for the Lord intended for us to sail, for the Lord intended to, uh, for us to enjoy this life. 
Not to sit around going, me, me, me. When you live in a way that is out of this world, when you live in a way where you are walking in the Spirit, when your Lord has transformed your, your life to where it's no longer yours, but you have died to self, and it is His life, people are going to want to know the way out of this world. And when people look at our lives and they say, man, those footprints don't look like them, why are they flying? How are they able to float through these tragedies? How are they able to do these things? Listen, we, we can do a, a, a sermon after sermon after sermon of making life better. Let me give you 10 ways to enjoy your life more. Or maybe we could just pause for a second. So God's got me. I am in the arms of the Lord. I can go through whatever he sets before me, and I want to run in the Spirit. I want to set sail with the Spirit. I want people to see the glory of the Lord and how I live my life. And when they say, what, what, what are you doing? I say, I'm living for the Lord. When I ask, well, how, what? I say, He's the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And that is a pointless statement if you look just like the rest of the world. But when people look at you and they see something different, and they hear you say, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. They will say, tell me more. Tell me more. When you live in worship, your life will defy gravity. When you live in worship, you will float through the bumps of this life because of the Spirit with you. You cannot escape where your feet are planted. I've heard a good man say, wherever your feet are, be there. You can't escape it. But you can set your heart on a higher plane and you can be in yet not of the world. So I say strap on some moon boots, y'all. I say strap on some moon boots. That Christian soldiers need to recognize that part of what we wear as we go through this life is moon boots. And you're going, moon boots? That ain't in the good book. Well, let's see what we got here. In Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the armor of God. Wait, does it really talk about moon boots? Hold on, hold on. Paul says, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. Prepared for what? For people to hear the good news. I am telling you, to defy gravity, to float, is a peaceful place. And no matter what struggles, what terrible things you are going through, when your heart can just cry out, oh, you're a strong God, you wear those moon boots. You worship in a way that defies gravity. You have put on the boots of peace that come from the good news. You have put on the sandals of righteousness of knowing who the Lord is. You will look and people will go, that ain't your footprints. And you will say, I know because I'm walking in step with the Spirit and it is such a peaceful place. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. And let me back up for a second. I'm going to read this. And this is a verse you guys have heard. And like, sounds great. But I'm going to put the red garment in with the whites on top. Because it says this. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. That sounds a lot like worship. That sounds a lot like a worship that defies what the world is going through. But after saying that, be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful. This verse comes in. It says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Some of your versions may say, do not 
quench the Holy Spirit. For the metaphor this morning, I'm going to say, do not unstrap the boots of the Holy Spirit. Because it's only in the Spirit you'll find joy. It's only in the Spirit you'll find those blessings. It's only in the Spirit you can move in peace, and people will look at you and go, tell me more. I want to know what you've got. I want to know the way you're going. Worship defies gravity. Paul repeats in Romans 10, 15, the verse Isaiah 52, 7. And he says this. He says, Blessed are the feet that bring good news. Blessed are the feet that bring good news. To live in worship. To live in worship is to live in a way that when people see you and they hear from you, they hear the good news. And so I hope you understand this morning and, and understanding as we're moving in worship, and I'm going to turn it over to the worship team right now, that blessed are the feet that bring good news. And when my feet look a lot more like me, there's griping, there's some complaining, there's some frustration. But when I'm in worship, a worship that defies gravity, a worship that is strapping on those moon boots, that is strapping on those shoes that promote the peace of the good news, blessed are the feet that bring good news.